Susan Arnovitz Plasker, and I want to thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta for asking me to demonstrate making chicken soup on this video for their website. Now, most of you probably know that there's as many ways to make chicken soup as there are grains of sand on the beach. Just like when you get two Jews together, you've got three opinions. When I was a newlywed, um, I didn't turn to my mom. She was a great hostess, but not known as a great cook. So I called one of my aunts, who's a fabulous cook, to ask me how to make real from scratch chicken soup, not just the little square cube kind. So she told me, you take a chicken and put it in a pot with some water, and then you add other ingredients. So of course I said, with my little pencil in hand, because I wanted all the exact proportions, how big of a chicken? Well, that depends on your pot, she said. How much water? Well, that depends on the size of the chicken. So as you can see, there won't be any exact proportions, and the more you do it, the more you learn what works for you, and it's a little bit of tasting, and, and adding a little bit of this and that, just like our grandmothers did, and our great-grandmothers. So this is what I do when I make chicken soup. I use a whole cut-up chicken, or what I was told a soup chicken, and now I've been told by the butcher that's a pullet. I put that in the pot along with carrots, and I'm really big on using only organic carrots. This came from a little taste test of my own. Taste an organic carrot and taste a regular carrot. You're going to see a huge difference. The regular one tastes like chemicals. People tell me my soup is great, my carrot cake's great, so use organic carrots. I promise you, you'll get lots and lots of pats on the back from your bubby. The celery adds its own natural salt, and the leaves have some of the best flavor, so put in lots of leaves and those little inside parts that you're not going to use for anything else because it's going to give it great flavor. Dill is the heart of the chicken soup. That's what really makes it taste good. I take an onion and peel it and just make a slit in it and put that in the pot. So you don't have to cut it up, just get all the skin off, peel it down, and make one little slit so the flavors can run out. Also going to put in parsley, gives it a nice fresh flavor. Now my Aunt Rini doesn't like parsley in her soup, but I find it tastes, tastes delicious and that's what my mother-in-law liked in hers. She was a fabulous cook and she added the next little bit of information for me. Another thing that my mother-in-law did that was wonderful is she adds a tomato. Tomato has natural sweetness and it gives it a really beautiful golden, golden, glowy color. The last is parsnips, which she used, which are kind of related to a carrot. They look like some people leave the cut up pieces of parsnip in the soup because it looks like potatoes and the kids will eat them. I just scrub mine, cut off the little top and bottom, and that's ready to go. Then salt. I put in kosher salt. How much salt? I start with a nice little tablespoonful in the middle of my hand, and of course that depends on how big my pot is and how much water. You can always add more. Of course, it's hard to take it out if it gets too salty. So don't be afraid to not add much at the beginning and just throw that in. So here's my onion, putting all my chicken in. It's probably best to add all your ingredients first because if you put the water in first and then you put your ingredients in, you might run out of room and then you've got to take water out, and that's a pain. So we're putting all the chicken in, the neck, all the pieces. You don't have to have it cut up. Sometimes it's easier just to put a whole chicken in because it's easy to find it afterwards. Celery. Let's cut the core out of the tomato. Just put this tomato in whole. You're going to strain the soup at the end so it doesn't matter how these go in. Some dill. Lots of parsley for freshness. We're going to cut these tops off of the parsnips, just to make sure there's no dirty parts. They've already been scrubbed. You can use regular carrots that haven't been um, these little ones. Um, I've just learned over the years that that's a time saver for me. I don't have to peel the carrots because we all know that when you take peeling away you lose vitamins. So I just buy the little ones that are already cleaned and ready to go and I don't have to do the work. I use a whole pound of carrots when I'm using one chicken, and I think because carrots definitely give it that sweetness and that delicious flavor, and we're going to add the water and the salt and put that on to boil. So what's a bowl of delicious hot steaming chicken soup without a matzo ball or canela floating in it? 
I think I make wonderful chicken soup. That's what my kids say and my family. But the award goes, I think, for the fluffiest, most delicious matzo balls to my cousin, Lisa arnovitz Belinky. So when I was putting a cookbook together for my kids, because they were moving into their own apartments and wanted mom's recipes, I thought I'd put a few of their favorites together and give it to each of them. Next thing I know, I had about 120 recipes and turned it into a cookbook for the family. So Lisa's recipe for matzo balls is the one that's in there, and that's the one I go by, and it gets rave reviews, just like this year at my Seder. So you start with just the plain old matzo ball mix that comes from Manischewitz. You don't need to buy the one with the soup because you're making your delicious own soup. So it comes with two little measured packets. You start just like they say on the box with two eggs, two large eggs cracked in the bowl. You beat them up a little bit just to blend the yellow and the white. Make sure you scrape out all the white when you crack your eggs. Get the whole egg in there. Then you just add two tablespoons of canola oil. And let's say a little word about that. I learned to make my matzo balls with chicken fat. My grandmother used to make the chicken fat, and I'd get it from her. I even tried making it myself one time. It is a big pain in the neck. It is delicious. It is terrible for us. So then I went to the jar of Naya fat, which is made with vegetable, and it's still that solid fat, which is still terrible for you. So I've gone to canola oil. That's what Lisa makes, and I think that's one of the things that makes them nice and fluffy, that it's liquid. So she says when you're measuring your tablespoons, as you're pouring, just keep pouring when you're pouring that oil in so that you get a nice stream and you're really getting a little bit of extra oil. And somehow that helps make them fluffy. You just blend that together, add the mix, just like on the package. It's got everything else you need in it. Blend that till all the ingredients are blended. Just like when I'm making cake, I like glass bowls so I can see what's on the bottom and make sure that I didn't leave any dry spots down there. It might be a little lumpy, but that's okay. But try and just blend it up where all the dry stuff gets wet. We're looking good. Now you're going to put that in the refrigerator for 15 minutes. 15, 20 tops. You don't want it to get too solid, as Lisa says. That's what's going to make them delicious. And they're going to be fluffy. We're going to boil those in some salted water. So into the refrigerator. We've got a pot full of vegetables and chicken. We're going to add cold water. And fill it up. Almost to the top. You don't want to go quite to the top. Because it is going to, when it starts boiling, obviously... When the, it gets hot, it is going to rise a little bit, so you have to leave a little room for that. But I like to get it as full as possible because you want everything to cook and then have room to cook down and really blend those favorite flavors and make them nice and strong and delicious. So I've got it almost all the way full. And by the way, make sure you can lift the pot. And if it's going to be real heavy, make sure you have somebody around that can do it if you can I use kosher salt. I just take a shaker and add from one of those big boxes. And I think for one chicken, like a nice, that's probably like a good tablespoon plus. Now with kosher chicken, don't forget, if you're using kosher chicken, which this is, you don't want to add too much salt because the chicken itself has salt on it already. But that's, again, depending on your family's taste, what kind of chicken you're using, and how you like it. But you can always add more later. So bring that over. Put it on a nice high heat to start and you're going to want to stay by. I find a conserved temperature. I just cover mine at the beginning to hold the heat in and to let it come to a boil faster. Let's get that salt down in there. So if you'll cover that and just keep an eye on it and feel it to know when it's starting to boil, you can take the lid off, but that way you're just holding the heat in, using up less energy and getting it to come to a boil. should take about you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, depending on how much water you, how much stuff you have in there. And then when it gets to another point, when it starts to simmer, we're going to uncover it, reduce it a little so it doesn't boil over, and skim off some of that foamy and brown and white stuff that comes up around the edges. But right now, we're just going to let it come to a boil. We've also got a pot of, pot of boiling water going here to boil for our matzo balls. So 
When that water boils and our 15 minutes are up, we're going to add our matzo balls. Put the salt in the water after it comes to a boil. So our water's boiling for our matzo balls. Let's salt the water now, just like a tablespoon. Take your matzo ball mixture. You're going to make about eight balls. We don't like them real huge in our family, so maybe everyone will eat one then. Just take about a big tablespoon of mixture, roll it to a nice ball, drop it in the water. It'll go down and it'll bring itself back up. Make sure your hands are damp so it doesn't stick that much. Roll it. Drop them in. If you need to, re-moisten your hands to keep them damp. And you should get about eight balls to this kind of mix. When Lisa makes them, they're huge. But Lisa's tiny, so she can afford to make them huge. I make them little because I like to serve lots of food with every meal and then everybody doesn't complain that they've eaten too much. After you drop them in the water, you're going to reduce it to a fairly low simmer because when you cover it, of course, it cooks faster and you're going to cook these covered for about 30 minutes. And that's all you have to do is let them cook themselves. When they're ready, just have a pot of warm soup. It doesn't have to be real hot, but just some soup that's warmed up to transfer them to. If you try moving them just to a bowl or something like that, they'll be fine, but they'll look a little misshapen. But if you put them into a liquid, they'll keep their nice, pretty round shape. So there we have eight balls. This last one will rise to the top. We'll cover the pot. Reduce it to a simmer. And let it cook for 30 minutes. Now, we're gonna, it's time to skim that soup. It's come to a boil. And the same thing, it's been on a nice high heat. I reduced it a little bit so it didn't boil over. I kept watching it. And it's starting to get that skim around the edges. So here's our little scummy stuff. Just take a spoon and a little dish. Sometimes if you just let it move the vegetables and things, it'll come to the edge where it's easier to grab it and go around and get this scum off. You'll have to do that a couple of times, maybe for about 20 minutes or so until that stops. And then as the soup gets, as you see it boiling, you keep it reduced to a simmer. So you see a little bubbling, but not a lot of action. So it can just simmer. Occasionally I might poke it and let certain vegetables or chicken pieces go down and others come to the top. So everything starts to cook evenly and let it cook for its three hours. So the chicken soup's been simmering for three hours and I've let it cool down a little bit so we can handle everything. First we're going to take out the chicken to get it out of the way so we can strain the soup and get our carrots out. Some people like to serve the soup with big chunks of chicken in it. Some people like to use the meat for other things. I've got a recipe my kids and I love in my cookbook for a Brunswick stew. It came from my half-sister in Birmingham. And instead of using the roasted chicken, sometimes I just use this chicken from the soup. Or I make a delicious chicken salad like my mom used to. And I'm sure your family has lots of things, everything from Saturday sandwiches with the chicken meat to whatever. So we take out a bunch of the chicken meat, put it aside, and let it cool till you can handle it. Then we're going to get those carrots out of there and put them in a separate bowl. I don't like to refrigerate them in the soup until I'm ready to heat it up to serve it, because if I freeze my soup, carrots get mushy. They just lose their texture, they lose their flavor. So I take them out and strain them out of the soup. Also, when I refrigerate my soup to skim off the fat the next day, it's no use those carrots having to get cold and hot and cold and hot and get mushy that way either. So if you'll just take them out, put them in a Ziploc when they cool off or in a container in the refrigerator, and just add them back when you're ready to serve your soup, they'll be much better off. 
So I just want to get them out so when I squeeze the vegetables to get the flavor into the soup, all the carrots are out. So we'll have carrots out, chicken out. Then I take the soup and I'll take my vegetables that are in here. You're getting your carrot, your parsley and dill and celery. You can save some of the celery if you want to serve in the soup too. Parsnips, unless you serve them. Onion, tomato. And you're going to put it into a strainer. Let your soup gather into a bowl if you get any of it. And use the back of a spoon and just press all the good juices out of your vegetables. The ones that you're going to discard because they look yuck now. So just press all that good, good juices out. That's where the flavor's in, your vegetables. Get all that out and let all that accumulate and put all that in your soup into a new bowl that you put in the refrigerator overnight, down in the back, down in the bottom if you can, undisturbed. If you have another refrigerator, that's even better. And let that fat accumulate so you can get a nice layer to pull off or skim and then you can reheat it, and you'll just have a lot less fat. It's going to make your soup taste better, and, of course, it's going to be better for you. And don't forget, don't put that hot soup in your refrigerator when it's still warm. Let it get down to room temperature. Otherwise, you'll warm everything up in your refrigerator and make a mess. Next thing you know, you'll be serving a delicious bowl of soup. Here are our finished matzo balls, all nice and fluffy. And we're going to take one and add it to this delicious bowl of steaming hot chicken soup with carrots. I'm going to take a taste. Mmm. Hot and delicious in your tummy, especially on a cool night. Mmm. Fluffy matzo balls like Lisa makes. And I think I'm going to finish this up and go check out the Federation website. And I'm going to see what everybody else has been cooking. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Federation, for asking me.